Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we pray your Holy Spirit come among our hearts and minds today so that your truth, your love, your grace be revealed to your people this day and always. In your name we pray. Amen. So I thought that version of this scripture passage helped us to identify with it a little bit more. But I have another question for you. What is this? It's okay to speak out. A checkerboard, right? And how many of you have ever played checkers? I'm assuming most everyone has probably played checkers at some point in their life. And you know, I didn't realize it until I began research on this sermon, but checkers is one of the oldest games known to man. Did you know that? Archaeologists think that the earliest form of the game was unearthed in an archaeological dig in, this, in the ancient city of Ur, which is in southern Mesopotamia, which is now modern-day Iraq, about the year 3000 BC. And Egypt had their own form of the game, which they called al kurke around 1400 BC. And just so you know when that was, that was around the same time when Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery into the Promised Land. Can you imagine Moses sitting around playing checkers? Now, neither one of these games look, look like the form of checkers that we now play today. That happened around 1100 AD when an innovative che- uh, Frenchman made the game board bigger with more spaces. And in 1847, they had their first championship, the World Checker Championship Games. And I looked it up. Actually, those events still happen today. Last year's events were held in New York City. And some guy in Italy won who's now holding the title. So just so we're clear, what kind of game is played on this board? Is it? Could you also play another game? Chess, right? So chess, of course, is also played on the same type of board. There are two different games, but the same game board. And these two games, checkers and chess, represent to me kind of the different ways of dealing with conflict. Checkers, for example, is what I call the mutually assured destruction approach. In checkers, in order to win the game, you literally have to decimate your opponent. You need to take away almost every one of their pieces, but in the process, you happen to lose most of your pieces as well. But by contrast, chess is an entirely different kind of game. I'm told that it's literally possible to win the game of chess without ever losing one piece on the board. Now, if I'm playing, that will never happen, but I know there are people that have done it. And when it comes to dealing with conflict on our lives, the world generally likes to think of it like playing chess. Sorry, playing checkers. But I would argue that God probably prefers that we play chess. Jesus says, You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the opening statement that Jesus is trying to teach here. And he goes on to follow up by telling us how we should look at our enemies. Most of the time, the first word that comes to mind when when we talk about our enemies is hate. Now, why would you regard someone as an enemy? Well, we've all had them. People who have hurt you, treated you unfairly, something they've done that's unforgivable, some, some, someone may have robbed you, cheated you, said nasty things about you. We've all been there. There's usually a really good reason why you shouldn't like them. And I'm sure if I asked everyone here, you can probably say at one point in your life, you've had a person do one of those things to you. Now, if a person has treated me like that, how am I likely to treat them? Am I going to pray for them? Maybe. Am I going to say nice things about them and mix company? 
If I'm being honest, not all the time. In fact, if someone is my enemy, I'm not likely to be doing anything nice for them at all. Instead, I'm more likely to be looking for an excuse to execute my own sense of judgment, my own sense of justice. If I've been hurt, they should hurt. If I've lost, they should lose. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as we hear in Scripture. It's only fair that they should suffer as much as they've made me suffer. And that's where checkers comes in. It's only fair, only right, that we get some sort of satisfaction from the pain of their enemies, even if we didn't even cause it to them. They've taken all my pieces off the board, so I should be able to take some of their pieces off the board too. And the more pieces I can take away from them, or watch being taken away from them by someone else, the more satisfaction we feel. I once read a story about a man in the state of Washington. His wife had filed for divorce, and he was furious, so much so that he went downtown to the courthouse and bought a permit for $11.50 a demolition permit. He then went home and bulldozed his entire three-bedroom, $85,000 home just to make sure his wife wouldn't get it. He wouldn't have it either, but that didn't matter to him. He was satisfied because he had, he had denied her something of value, and that's the game of checkers. Checkers is a game of mutually assured destruction. I'm going to hurt you because you hurt me. And I don't care how much it costs me because I'm going to win. Winning is the object of the game, and the more I hurt you in the process, the better I'm going to feel. Like I said, checkers is mutually assured destruction. Now, if you look at the first letters of those words, what does it spell? Mutually assured. Assured destruction. M A D. I'm mad and I'm going to make the other person pay. So Jesus starts out this part of his teaching by addressing that mindset. You have heard it said love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In essence, he's saying that's how the world plays this game. But then Jesus tells us that is not how we ought to be playing. Love my enemies? Pray for them? Why on earth would I want to do that? The answer is so that I can be like my Father, my Creator. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Okay, but why would would God want us to do that? Why does it matter that we become like God? Well, God wants us to be different, to stand out in the crowd. God is kind to those who are his enemies. And so God wants us to be known as those who don't hurt those who hurt us. Have you ever thought about how hard it sometimes may be for our God to look down at each of us daily and to say, oh, there she goes again. I love her, but there she goes again. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Paul wrote that in the book of Ephesians. If we were playing checkers with God, we wouldn't stand a chance. Not only would we have lost all of our pieces on the board, there wouldn't be a board. We'd not only lose, but we'd end up in the opposite of what we had been promised in our baptism. 
But God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. Despite what the world may think, God doesn't want to destroy anyone. God doesn't really want to decimate our game boards. God's desire is always to save, not to destroy. Peter writes again, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, that's God's game plan. God intended to win this game with us without losing any more pieces than necessary. And Jesus tells us that's how God wants you and I to treat others. God wants us to be like God. And if he's our father, then you and I should grow to asp- and aspire to be just like him. And there's another reason that God asks us ask this of us. You know, a lot of Christians believe that all is required for you to come to church, to make sure your kids attend these rites of passages, the first communion and confirmation, and pray and receive sacrament and occasionally listen to a a person that might be preaching and you're all good. Don't misunderstand me, though. I'm glad you're all here and listening. But we have a bigger responsibility than that. We have a bigger mission. We are called to be disciples and missionaries of Jesus Christ. Christ didn't come to this earth to die. Christ came to bring truth and life for all people, and in doing his mission, he died on the cross for you and I. Did you get that? Christ didn't come to die. He came to give us life and truth. And it was because he was doing that mission that led him to the cross to die. When people see us, they are looking for the image of our Father. And the only way they're going to see our Father in us is if we love our enemies. Loving our enemies the way God loves us. Now, what exactly does that mean? It means that when you're in a conflict or confrontation, your goal should always be to avoid making the other person pay. Your goal should always be to find a way to forgive the other person. Garrison Keeler said it this way, Do unto others who don't like you as you would have them do unto you. But you know they won't. Shame them with goodness. Kill them with kindness. Cut their throats with courtesy. The 11th chapter of Romans says it this way. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. You see, by forgiving your enemy, you've actually gotten justice. They thought they can hurt you and destroy you, but if you forgive them, they sometimes get frazzled. You know, I've shared this story before with some of you about how when I was younger, I was not a pleasant child. I was a bit of a bully. And I always was getting in fights, mostly I would be winning all the time. And I'd come home and brag to my mother. And my mother would say, one day, it's going to catch up with you. One day. And I said, I just thought she was crazy. And I said, no, that's never going to happen. Until one day I'm walking home from school, and a large group of kids are following behind me. I walk faster, they walk faster. I walk faster, they walk faster. And pretty soon they caught up. Needless to say, I end up limping home with a few wounds and scratches, bleeding a bit. And I walk in, and there stands my mother. And she just looks at me and shakes her head. She says, I told you so. I said, yeah, Mom, but I I need, I need, no, 
You go in there and clean yourself up. Yeah, but I'm bleeding and go in there and clean yourself up. I went to sleep that night really thinking about every, how everything transpired and all the people I had hurt. And the next day, when I got to the school, went to the lunchroom, and I saw one of the boys who was kind of the head of that group sitting in the lunch table by himself, I walked up to him. And I know he was expecting me to swing at him. I saw it in his face. But instead, I put my hand out there and I said, no more, okay? He shook my hand. We both nodded our head. And that was the last fight I ever got in. Now, here's the deal. You and I live in the real world. We're going to get hurt now and again. And once in a while, it's really going to hurt. We're going to be tempted to fight, to strike out, to hurt the other person. And when that happens, we have a choice to make. How are we going to respond to that pain, to that injustice? We can respond like many in our world by trying to get the personal satisfaction and getting all the pieces. Or we can ask ourselves what God would have done in that situation and choose that path. My brothers, sisters in Christ, we all know that there are terrible tragedies all around us right now in our community, in our state, and certainly in our nation. What this passage is all about is choosing to respond to injustices through the lens of Christ to see all people black, white, Hispanic, refugee, illegal immigrant, migrant worker, homosexuals, and countless others the way God sees us. The Greek word that's used in this final phrase there for perfect is the word teleos. Can you say that? Teleos. Translated in English, it actually means mature. It means full-grown. That's what we are called to do, to maturely view others as God does, to remember that God forgave us and paid the ultimate price for all of us. And when we remember that, and we try to respond to the hatred in this world with the love that Jesus gave, only then can we truly honor the great chess and checker player in the sky. Amen.